House investigative report. Whoa, that has you know that has a certain um, intimidation feature right there. The word investigation, investigative. Uh, so Tom Yamachika is going to tell us about this on Talking Tax with Tom this morning. Uh, good morning, Tom. Morning, Jay. Thank you for having me on the show. So we have um, uh, an investigative committee that was formed by the House <clears throat> to follow up on two pre-existing audits made by the state auditor of number one, the Department of Land and Natural Resources Special Land and Development Fund, and number two, the Agribusiness Development Corporation. Uh, to exact and the uh, the scope of the committee's responsibility was to uh, examine the recommendation made in those audits and for purposes of improving the operation and management of these state agencies, their funds, and any other matters. Now, the last few words of what I just said is kind of where things start going south and any other matters, because according to the committee chair, that let her investigate it. That, that let her investigate anything else she wanted, especially the state auditor himself. Who's the committee chair? Uh, Della Albilotti. Hmm. She was involved in earlier contentions with the state auditor, wasn't she? Oh yeah. Um, when uh, the Speaker of the House, Scott Psyche, uh put together a a, a committee to. Um, basically rigged the audit over the coals. Uh, there were several bills introduced uh, by the House Majority Leader, who she is, uh, to you know, uh, mess up their budget and you know, uh, merge them into another agency, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, to, to basically get rid of uh, the Office of the Auditor as, a, as an entity. Well, this sounds like a continuation of that campaign, no? Well, it could be. Um, it's very, it's very suspicious. Uh, the investigative report has come out, and there is an explanation, or or something like that, in the report that explains to the reader why uh, the. Uh, the committee decided to take its to take its sights uh, off the uh, off the two agencies uh, and onto the auditor. Uh, she, you know, the, the report says, although the committee's initial investigation focused on audit report numbers nineteen dash twelve and twenty one dash zero one and the audited agencies, the LNR and ADC. The committee expanded its focus to include the Office of the Auditor. When the committee was, one, met with evasion by the auditor in answering simple questions about the audit process. Two, prevented from reviewing documents that are the basis of the auditor's findings and recommendations. And three, apprised of critical omissions in the audit process that may constitute malfeasance and noncompliance with generally accepted government auditing standards utilized by government auditing agencies throughout the country and represent a larger pattern by Auditor Kondo to unilaterally decide not to report on certain substantive and critical issues discovered in the field. You know, you know it sounds like that, that old scenario where you punish the messenger for the message. Yeah, and that, and that is why we're concerned um, you know, we being uh, the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, uh, you know, a watchdog agency, uh, we consider the state the state office of the auditor to be, you know, a watchdog as well. Uh, they're supposed to, you know, take a look at uh, how other agencies function, um, and bring the truth to light, which is what a watchdog does. And uh, you know, it's like. You know the the NATO treaty of of watchdogism. An attack on one watchdog is an attack on us on us all. <laughs> well, let me let me ask. You know, does the committee also have the power to say, look, you know, we we found a, a, some flaws in your report and your methodology. 
um, you know, no, no rancor here. Just can you go back and take a look at that uh, and, and answer us uh, a few questions? Um, this doesn't sound like that. This sounds like not spet accompli and we're punishing you. Uh, and it's different than what perhaps uh, another investigative committee might do. In other words, go, we're, we're a little concerned about the report and check out a few things and get back to us. Uh, it seems to me that would be an appropriate solution here. Instead, they're going much further than that. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so too. Um, I mean, and and uh, with regard to those, you know, reasons that that are the cited basis of changing the committee's focus. Okay, let's let's look at those. I mean, met with evasion by the auditor and answering simple questions about the audit process. Now that that's kind of full of value judgments on, you know, what's a simple question and, and what is evasion? Um, if, you know, if, if somebody asked me about a tax audit, for example, um, and I tried to explain, you know, the, the procedure behind, the, you know, tax audits as I knew them, uh, it's very easy for somebody to say, well, you, you didn't answer the question that I asked. You must be evading me. Mm. Second, yeah. um, the, the committee complains of being prevented from reviewing documents that are the basis of the auditor's findings and recommendations. That's because there's a state statute that makes those confidential. Didn't this happen in the previous iteration of this kind of attack? He, he, he didn't want to re reveal documents because they were treated as, because the state order the statute treats them as confidential and they were, they were criticizing him for that. That sounds oh, yeah. familiar to me. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly what happened. And uh, this is just, I think, another iteration of that same argument. Hmm. Well, it's very troublesome um, uh, because it, 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 does, it does have a certain uh, aura about it that is not positive at all. And I'd like to digress for just a moment, Tom. You know, we, we just uh, completed a movie, okay, with the help, the help of uh, filmmaker uh, Kimberly Basford uh, here at Think Tech, and it's, it's called Scaling Up Hawaii's Food Future. And we looked into the status of agriculture and development of agriculture as a way to feed the people of the state you know, a, a sustainability examination. And we found that the legislature, and, and we talked to Donovan Dela Cruz and uh, also uh, Glenn Wakai, and uh, we found that uh, the, the state really wasn't doing much and it wasn't spending much money. We talked to Todd Lowe with the Department of Agriculture and found the same thing. The state is not doing much. Uh, and this, you know, in a, in a crisis, you know, in a, in a, in a casualty of some kind of disaster of some kind, um, we can't feed ourselves. Uh, we will starve. Uh, if those ships don't get here with the food, pretty much all the food comes from the mainland on ships, um, we will starve. And, and so it's really critical that we get back to agriculture as one of the diversified elements of the economy. And so the legislature is spending 1% of the budget. I said 1% of the budget, if, if not less on the development of agriculture in the state. We're not doing anything. We're talking it up, but we're not doing anything. And so to me, this is a really important public policy inquiry. And to me, every state organization of any kind, uh, and for that matter, uh, NGOs, nonprofits of any kind is critically important uh, to the state for the development of agriculture in our state. We have the land. Um, we have the weather, we have the quality of soil. Most cases we have the water, but we don't have the labor. We don't have the political will to do anything about it. And so this is a real sensitive issue as far as I'm concerned. And sure, and, and, one the, and, and one of the and one of the findings in the audit of the Agribusiness Development Corporation was, well, you know, what, what the heck got, have you guys done? That's that. That's a good, that, and that is kind of the issue uh, that's been debated a plenty in this current legislature, uh, and 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 it's, it's all around. Well, what are we going to do with ADC? Are we going to fold them into somebody else? Are we going to let them stay? 
uh, what are we going to do with them? And there were, there were lots of debates on that issue this legislative session. So um, uh, somehow this is a hot issue. It's a hot issue because we haven't done anything. I don't know if there's any legislation <laughs> pending, but we do have legislation giving money away. I mean, I, what did I see in Civil Beat this morning? Uh, depending on your uh, level of income, the state is thinking about giving you a hundred uh, to three hundred dollars uh, bonus gift at the end of the session. So what's that about? Have we paid all our bills? Have we paid the employees' retirement system? Have we handled the homeless? Do we not need that money in the state coffers? Couldn't we use that money on developing agriculture in the state, which is critical to our sustainability in time of crisis? So I'm, I'm wondering um, whether we got our heads screwed on right about the priorities of um, holding and spending money. Well, that's that's been an issue for some time now. <clears throat> you, you may recall we have a constitutional provision that says um, if we have a, a surplus in the state general fund for a couple of years in a row, then we have to deal with it either by giving a you know giving it back to taxpayers. That's that's item number one. That was in the earliest version of the constitutional provision. And then they added stuff like, well, or we can you know, put it in the rainy day fund, or we can, you know, pay down um, uh, you know, for the, the fund for uh, uh, benefits to government, government workers that we owe. Well, um, okay. The, the, the OPEB issue. <laughs> to me, uh, the last thing you would do in a time when we haven't paid our bills and we need to develop the infrastructure around the state is give it back. That's the last time, the last thing we would do. I don't understand, but you know, then I thought to myself, Tom, I thought to myself, this is what I thought. I said, gee whiz, it's 2022. It's an election year that has a lot to do with it, right? Well, of course it does. Every one of those people in the square building is up for re-election. So uh, what better way for the incumbents to demonstrate their you know, concern for their constituents, unquote, uh, by, by you know, giving them a check? Yeah. I, I think, I, and, and you know, it wasn't their idea originally. The governor introduced it. Uh, and the legislative leaders snuffed it out earlier in the session, but then they decided, well, let's maybe let's bring this back. Maybe it was a good idea after all. So that's what that's what they're thinking right now. Too bad. I mean, uh, we are so far behind. I mean, last time I, I looked, uh, we had either liquidated or unliquidated bills to pay of 40, 50 billion dollars, and we're giving it back, and we're not making any plans to diversify the economy. Uh, and furthermore, we're not even taxing the one area of the economy that's that's uh, that's that's um, prosperous. That is hospitality. So I I don't understand uh, how you make that decision about giving it back. But well, I want to ask mean, you. Go ahead. That's a that's, that's a politician for you. Okay. The other the other issue uh, that this audit dealt with, and, and we've you know, previously had uh, shows about this on, on here on Think Tech, uh, was the uh, Department of Land and Natural Resources and its Special Land and Development Fund. And that, that, that Special Land and Development Fund uh, basically concerns when the state owns properties and leases them out, uh, this is the money that comes back from them. And, and the question you know, came up as to, well, are, are, is this being you know, treated properly. So uh, we had a, a gentleman on our show, you know, uh, his, his name is Keith Chun. Um, he gave us a lot of information about what really was going on because he used to work there. And, uh, and he said, look, you know, I, I made specific recommendations to management. Uh, they were ignored. Uh, these people like have no idea how to write a percentage, you know, percentage rent lease. Uh, he cited the example of one particular hotel um, where the percentage rent was based on the year to come rather than the year previous. So uh, apparently the people uh, in the 
in the hotel took the position that, well, we don't know uh, how much revenue we're going to get in the year to come. So they paid no percentage rent at all. Oh, no. And the um, <laughs> and then the try land that in the business community, just try that. <laughs> and and the and the state accepted that for a number of years. So this is the kind of stuff uh, that, that that Keith wrote about, that the auditor wrote about. What did the uh, investigative committee find? Oh, it was an inadvertent oversight. Mm. A lot of money involved, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, in the business community, even if it wasn't inadvertent oversight, you would you would have uh, the lessor, you know, going to the lessee and saying, "Well, look, um, uh, un under under the lease, you owe percentage rent. You didn't pay it, so we need to get it out of you." And uh, and if the uh, uh the lessee says well you know go take a long walk off a short pier you know you're in court yeah. well what is you know gee whiz this is this is um what however you cast this it doesn't lead to a good result the outcome isn't good the outcome isn't good with the, that deal in our fund uh the leases and the outcome isn't good with um, agriculture um, we should we should be looking at the public policy aspects of this. So query, you know, we know that um, Les Condo uh, disputes all of these attacks on his agency. Uh, how has he responded to the attack on his um, on his reports on the uh, agribusiness uh, organization? Well, he he did submit a very lengthy response. Uh, and the, you know, to the committee's credit, they, they attached it to the report as an appendix. Uh, they attached uh, Keith Chun's response as, a, as an appendix to the report also. So, uh, you know, query what it does back there, you know, in, in the, in the, at the end of the report, uh, but, it's, but it's there if you want to read it. Well, where, where is this going? Well, that that's that's the thing. Um, what can you expect with, uh, you know, with a report of this nature? Uh, you know, not a whole lot. I mean, the the uh, in the report itself, the the committee complained mightily and and loudly about, well, geez, you didn't give us enough time to to do uh, to do anything. Yeah, and then and then you, and you go around smearing the auditor. <laughs> Well, that, you know, that, that's what, it, you know, it feels like a, a strike, or rather a spare, a spare in bowling, where you get one pin on the left, and that's the agricultural, you know, development community, and you get one pin on the right, and that's the auditor. And in this case, uh, and both pins went down. Um, I don't think this helps the development of agriculture at all in the state, which should be a very high priority, and, and the smear uh, somehow, you know, with all of these events, doesn't help them. It hurts them. Likewise, uh, it hurts uh, Les Condo and, and the auditor. Uh, so what's the, what's the benefit of exactly? I mean, uh, I, I, I'm trying to look. I'm, I'm trying to be open-minded about it. What is the benefit of writing a report like that, attacking the messenger um, for the message? Well, I mean, you really can't expect the, the um, message to justify a whole lot of stuff because, as you might expect, um, the findings uh, critical of how you know the, st the status quo uh, have have said X, and the report says, well, uh, the messenger is a dimwit, so let's keep going with the status quo you know, what evidence is there or what justification is there to depart from the status quo? So and there it is, there it is. I think you really have an important point. So it, it neutralizes the report of the auditor. It makes it a non-report. Non I mean, he's been dinged for it, and uh, or the two of them, right? Um, he's been dinged for his reports and they are essentially neutralized. They have, they have no effect. He's kind of stopped in his tracks. At the same time, to the extent that somebody could have, should have, would have said something 
to improve the operation of these agricultural organizations, that is also undermined. And you never get to the substance. You never yeah, find so that's, out that's what that's what happened with Mr. Chun. Um, he uh, he's a well-meaning individual. He he collected lots of evidence and and uh, you know specific factual circumstances um, that he gave the committee. Uh, uh, the agency says, "Oh well, I'm sorry. You know, this is this is a one-time error, and and uh, it won't happen again. We really promise." You know, um, and then of course nothing happens. Do you expect anything to happen? I don't think so. No, the money's lost. Yeah, A, the money's lost. B, there, there really is no, no pressure on the agency to, 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 to depart from the status quo. Because, yeah, there were audit findings. The audit findings are now neutralized. Uh, the, uh, the messenger who brought them is neutralized. The... Uh, you know the, the other messengers who came in with, uh, with with important information, uh, are are being kind of like shunted to the side. So so where, you know, how do things get better? Well, um, I guess the first question is why. I mean, what is what is the task? What is the mission of this investigative committee? Um, and who decides what they investigate and where do they get their members and how are they operating? Are they operating properly? You know, investigative committees have a lot of power, especially when it goes to the press, which this did. And, and the previous instance that it did go to the press and became a public spectacular. Um, you know, what, what is the point of the investigative committee? How well are they operating in general? Well, the investigative committee you know, can be uh, made by a, a resolution that the uh, House members vote on. And in this case, they did. They, they enacted uh, House Resolution Number 164, and that's what, that's what uh, spawned the investigative committee. Uh, the Speaker then appoints Is this members the to it. the same committee in both cases? Is it the same committee in the one case and in the second case you've been talking about? Yeah, the the um, the same committee investigated both the ADC and the DLNR. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they were they were given you know a, a, a double barreled mission there, mm -hmm. and uh, so I mean, all it takes is a, a you know a resolution by you know either the House or the Senate or both. Is there a political edge to this, um, or is or is this the kind of thing that happens all the time. Now, this, is the, this is the first investigative committee uh, of its kind that we've seen in a very, very long time. I mean, uh, when the committee was starting up, uh, they were saying, well, yeah, we don't really have a precedent. We went, went back several years uh, and, and there's really nothing to go on. So we're kind of making some, some stuff up like the, you know, the procedural rules of the committee and so forth, because there, there, there was no, there was nothing they can cut and paste from. Mm. How would, so, you, how would you fix this? How would you make a committee like this beyond beyond politics, beyond retribution, um, to come up with a you know positive, even-handed kind of investigation with positive, even-handed recommendations that are actually constructive in the sense that they um, that they enhance public policy? Well, I, I think as long as you have the right people doing it, it would be okay. Like um, Rep Kobayashi um, uh, was was on the committee, and he really wanted to do the right thing. I thought uh, Rep Tarnas as well. Uh, but uh, you know, you know how it is in our state legislature. If you're not the committee chair, you you know, you, you may as well you know be a potted plant. Mm. Well, that bespeaks of larger issues. Um, you know, I'm just, just as a, a, a footnote, I saw uh, another article this week about how the uh, Supreme Court's action on Gutton Replace uh, was now being mm, mm, tested. Tested, thank you. And that there were forces in the legislature trying to get around that decision. Um, this is an attitudinal thing. Um, any comment on that? 
Well, um, not not at this time. I mean, I, I certainly want to see what uh, the legislation looks like in its final form. If it's you know if it's signed into law, then uh, then I think you know our organization as well as others uh, are going to weigh whether you know whether it's uh, beneficial to challenge it. But, but that that's that that issue is going to be still there. In a larger sense, though, and it's really a core point for our discussions together, Tom. It sounds to me like we need um, reform. We need reform on how things work. And uh, we can talk about other areas of government, but at least in in the legislature. Well, not not only, not only there. I mean, um, you know, it's it's kind of a telling thing that uh, in the uh, investigative report, it it, it quoted, uh, you know, for. Uh, Les Condo's criticism, uh, a quote from the, you know, the former city auditor, okay, uh, Edwin Young, I think his, his, his name was, uh, saying that uh, Mr. Kondo was the poster child for poor auditing. Well, um, <laughs> this, this dude uh, was at the city, and you've got like, you know, multiple waves of federal indictments going through there. You got your you got your problems at Department of Planning and Permitting. Uh, you have your Kealoha, you know, settlement. You have, uh, you know, the the Corp Council going down on indictment. You have uh, the Chief of Staff going down on indictment. You have the head of the Police Commission going down on indictment. W what the hell kind of shop is he running there, or was was he running there? Because he was, it, it, it was it was his shop at the time. So is is he? Like the pot calling the kettle black. Yeah, interesting. Where is this? Um, but but where, where? What? What do we do? What do we do? Uh, if if a, if you were if you represented a candidate running for office this year, this is an election year. What would you tell your constituents or your voters that you would do um, to start the ball rolling on this kind of internal reform? Uh, that would clear these things up. You know, that's that's a really tough one because um, uh, a lot of these things are are you know well ingrained, and it's it's really really tough for one person to uh, try to unwind things uh, because it's very very easy uh, to get clobbered when you attempt to do something. Mm, yeah, right. The, the nail that you, <laughs> or the or the crab crawling out of the pot, all Hawaii Hawaii references for many many years. Um, <laughs> the other question is, uh, I mean, is this also is it also a function of gubernatorial leadership? I mean, could we have a certain level of reform and focus in the legislature um, if the governor took a more positive role on these things? I think so. Uh, I think if um, there was uh, a lot more definite direction being, uh, you know, pushed through this process, you know, and, 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 you know, come on, I mean, these are executive agencies in the first place. Okay. It's within the governor's power to say, you know, look, Mr. You know, chairman of DL DLNR, clean this stuff up. Now. Yeah, right. It would just be um, a, a kind of policeman at the elbow sort of thing where you tell him as a sort of a big brother, can't do this. So yeah. uh, where, where are we in terms of the, um, the um, I guess it was indictments um, of a couple of legislator, legislators, and then more recently, uh, one legislator was found to have, I guess, used, used campaigns funds for private purposes. And so there were three of them in, in the past month or so um, that were embarrassed with, um, I call yeah, it. Yeah, I think, I think the first two pleaded guilty. And mm -hmm. then uh, the, the third one, I think, um, is going to pay a fine or something like that to get the case closed. So what, what I'm getting at, though, is that these three in a row, I mean, they all really have the same effect on public confidence in government and specifically in the legislature. Yeah, you know, it doesn't help. It doesn't help at all. No, it doesn't help. 
because you know you, you say to yourself okay well these guys got caught but what about the guys that did exactly the same thing and didn't get caught so right, you got to wonder about that yeah i mean the average person is going to wonder about that and he's going to draw some conclusions uh, from the three cases and say hmm, uh, maybe i should be concerned about hmm, the whole institution um well, so, so I guess the, the moral of the story then is when you go to the polls, you, know, tr you try to find out as much as you can about who you're voting for. How do you it's... do that? How do you do that, Tom? Because sometimes it's uh, only in the back room and you would never find out. Well, I mean, during the campaign process, lots of things come out. Uh, you hope that more comes out. Uh, we, you know, we need uh, people to be challenged. If they're, if they're unopposed, then none of this is going to happen. Um, not necessarily by, you know, the other party, but even by the, even uh, with the same party, with, uh, you know, somebody who generally, genuinely desires public service and, and who wants to make this place better. I think uh, one, the one takeaway point I would take out of your comment just now is that, um, more people ought to run for office, uh, and that and that breaks the um, um, the phenomenon where uh, somebody can stay in office for term after term after term, and they become, you know, um, entrenched. Entrenched. Thank you. Yeah. And, and there's an organization that I that I heard the name of, and I, I just want to mention it. It's a national organization, but the idea is that if you want to save democracy, make it uh, more robust, um, you run for office. And this is called runforsomething.net, runforsomething.net. And the woman who was the founder and runs it, it's, it's a substantial organization now, and you can look at their website, uh, is uh, Amanda Littman, L-I-T-M-A-N. And uh, we, could, we could enjoy an organization like that here. I don't know if there are any. Um, but certainly the notion of that national organization should, could spill over to individual states and for that matter, counties. Um, and we could have the benefit of ordinary citizens who say, gee, it, it, it's, not, it's not that I'm angry and mad and I'm not gonna take it anymore, although that, that could be you know, one motivation. It's that I feel I have to do my duty. Uh, in order to keep them all straight, I have to run for office, I have to read up, I have to make the arguments that, you know, contending candidates make, and I have to keep the process, uh, you know, um, active. And, and so I think more people should run for office, whether or not they get the blessing of the party, whether or not they get, you know, for example, union endorsements, um, they should still run for office and make their case. What do you think? No, I think, um... Uh, I, I would. I wish more people would would do that. That they would, that they would uh, make their case to the people and 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 run for office. Yeah. And 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 try to help. You know, once they get in. Yeah, I think a lot of people are intimidated for the fact that um, you know raising money ain't so easy, and sometimes a person in office who has collected money on an unopposed uh, race will apply that money to, you know, somebody who is opposed, um, who uh, the party wants to favor. And it's, it's, it's kind of perverse. And the, and the, the first time candidate doesn't have those, those benefits at all. Um, and so you have to have a strong stomach and you have to keep on, keep on trucking. Yep. And, uh, and even if only one in a few actually get to home base on this, it's still worth the process. It's still worth the effort. Um, at, right here in Hawaii, it's still worth the effort. And maybe, just maybe, we can sort things out a little better in terms of priorities and follow through and, and for that matter, a clean procedure. That's great. Okay. I think we're out of time, Tom. Um, but let's plan on doing this again in two weeks. And we'll find something else of, of, of merit, of note, uh, because I guarantee you there will be something else. Thank you very much, Tom Yamachika, Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Uh, here Thanks on. for having me on the show. Take care. Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.